Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Paul Merzlach, Editor-in-Chief of U.S. Naval Institute Proceedings Magazine. And I'd like to thank all of you again for joining us here in uh, San Diego this week and welcome you to this afternoon's panel. Uh, just a reminder, you may follow this conference via Twitter hashtag West13, the daily on-scene reports via U.S. Naval Institute and AFSEA websites, and on YouTube, Naval Institute, and in the Naval Institute app. This afternoon's panel is the fiscal cliff, how do you make it add up? Obviously a very timely question, and thinking about what Admiral Winnefeld said this morning, uh, of knowing that we're going to have less money, but we don't know how much. Uh, and uh, he spoke of, you know, getting the ends right, and that being uh, the main influencer over what we do. And uh, this afternoon's uh, very distinguished panel is going to try and continue that discussion on and, again, try and find out how it all adds up. Uh, a difficult task, to be sure. The panel is moderated by Mr. Brad Penniston, editor of Armed Forces Journal, founded in 1863 as the Army-Navy Journal, and it is the nation's oldest independent periodical in military affairs. Mr. Penniston is a 1991 graduate of Yale with a degree in Soviet and Eastern European studies. And he spent time after graduation working in Moscow as a reporter and editor. After returning to the States, he held positions with the Annapolis Capitol, Navy Times, Defense News, and then finally joined Armed Forces Journal. In 2000, he helped launch Military.com, creating the first online-only newsroom to earn Pentagon press credentials. Mr. Penniston is also the author of two books, including No Higher Honor, Saving the USS Samuel B. Roberts in the Persian Gulf, published by Naval Institute Press in 2006. He's a lecturer who has appeared at the Naval Historical Center, Center for Naval Analyses, and Defense Acquisition University, among other places. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Penniston. be up here with three gentlemen who uh, are going to talk a little bit about where, where the rubber meets the road. We have heard good discussions, uh, good high-level discussions about the budgetary fix we find ourselves in, um, and it is, is uh, truly, truly wonderful that we have some folks here who can tell us a little bit about what's going to happen uh, to the fleet and, and to one MEF if, if this comes down. Um, I liked Admiral Winnefeld's uh, picture early on of, of uh, wolves pursuing a rocket sled. Uh, it was a good bit of imagery and, and perhaps uh, indicates uh, just how far we need to stretch a metaphor in order to show what extraordinary times we are in. Um, the Navy leadership, of course, is already slowing down O&M obligations as, as, as cuts uh, near. Um, last week, you're probably aware, the CNO set out uh, some, uh, some plans for what happens if the continued resolution is passed in lieu of a real budget, um, canceling more than two dozen ship availabilities, canceling third and fourth quarter aircraft maintenance, totaling some $400 million. Uh, all this, of course, is subject to congressional intervention, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, you may have also have seen a little more recently uh, some options being out, uh, laid out by Navy leadership on what happens if the sequester comes down. And this uh, is where it really starts to sound serious. Things like canceling all deployments uh, to Europe that aren't of a BMD nature, canceling all ops around South America, cutting flying hours uh, on, uh, on carriers in the Persian Gulf by 55%, um, extending Truman and Ike deployments indefinitely. Uh, you know, again, time will tell whether this actually happens, but, uh, but these are the things that are getting uh, batted around now. Um, it was also interesting to hear Admiral Winnefeld talk about uh, finding ways to reduce COCOM's demand signals. This is something, of course, that has been a topic of conversation, but, but in public at least, generally at lower levels. And now you've got it up for action at the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff level, and, and that is interesting as well. Um, but as I said, we are, we are here now to hear uh, some gentlemen who are actually in charge of manning, training, and equipping naval forces, and uh, I am delighted to be able to, to give them a, a little bit of an introduction, uh, and then we'll get to, get to hearing what they have to say. 
Um, next to me, Vice Admiral David Buss. He is the Navy's Air Boss, more formally the commander of Naval Air Forces and the Pacific Fleet's Air Forces. He is commanded at virtually every level, from an A6 squadron, aircraft carrier, a fast combat support ship, carrier strike group, and most recently at Fleet Forces Command, he was in charge of Task Force 20. I served a year in Baghdad as Director of Strategic Plans and Assessments. And perhaps of special relevance to this panel, he has done a stint on the CNO's uh, staff where he was in charge of assessing U.S. Navy strategy against global employment demands and budgetary realities. Uh, next to him, we have uh, Vice Admiral Tom Copeman, the man in charge of manning, equipping, and training Naval Surface Forces. Uh, his formal titles are Commander of Naval Surface Forces and of the Pacific Fleet's Surface Forces. He has commanded a destroyer and a destroyer squadron, as well as Joint Task Force Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And he was until last year the Navy's Chief of Legislative Affairs, which no doubt gives him a very interesting perspective given Congress's central role in, in our budgetary fix. Um, and finally, we have Lieutenant General John Toole, U.S. Marine Corps, commander of 1MEF, headquartered at Camp Pendleton. Uh, his experience, his command experience is likewise broad. Um, he has commanded an infantry company, a light armored recon battalion, regimental combat team, Marine Division. He has seen combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. In 2011, he deployed to Afghanistan where he commanded, commanded two MEF as well as all international forces in the southwest region of that country. Um, he has led the Marine Corps staff, commanded staff college at Quantico. And apropos of the theme of West 2013, he also has deep experience in leadership and policy in the Pacific region. Uh, so again, a, a, a fine panel. I can't think of three people we'd rather hear from uh, today. Um, the format for this panel will be fairly straightforward. Um, we'll let uh, each of these three gentlemen speak for about three to five minutes on uh, opening statements, and then I'll have a few questions, and then we'll get to your questions. I would ask just a few things of you uh, as an audience, which is uh, think a little bit about your question before you come to the mic. Um, and then once you're there, make sure your question ends in a question mark. So, um, with that, I think I'll let uh, Admiral Dave Buss go ahead. Okay, thanks, Brad. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the kind introduction, but I would point out that uh, uh, I was so poor at matching strategy to budget, CNO fired me from that job and sent me back to the fleet. So if that's any indicator uh, for you this afternoon. I've also got to mention that I feel a bit of a role reversal here. Um, sitting in the front row is my first skipper from my very first squadron. And not to age either one of us, but I was a young junior officer sitting in the back of the ready room, and now I find myself up here with the skipper out in the crowd. So. Good to see you again, Herb. Um, let me start with just a few thoughts, if I could, from my perspective as the Navy's air boss. And, uh, and I hope that at some point during the panel we, and I mentioned this to Brad as we were uh, prepping to come in a few minutes ago, uh, I hope we can tie the discussion at some point back to the theme for FCA West, which is really the Pacific pivot and rebalancing and how do we do that. Uh, certainly against the backdrop of some pretty challenging uh, fiscal and financial times today and in the future, but uh, I think that's an important tie to make back at the end. And if you give me the opportunity, in particular with some of your questions, I'll be happy to do that. Um, you heard a little bit about my background. I'm about three and a half months into uh, the job now as Commander of Naval Air Forces. Uh, welcome aboard, bus. Here, catch this with some of the financial challenges that we have. Um, and I, I want to start by just highlighting, uh, as we've done some of the internal planning that we've done within Navy, certainly that I've done uh, within the Naval Aviation Forces, as I look at what's uh, looming on the horizon potentially and what's in the art of the possible for the future, uh, our focus has really been threefold. And I think it's important to highlight this. I suspect uh, Secretary Work and Admiral Winnefeld may have hit on the same themes this morning when they had the opportunity to talk. But first and foremost, we want to make sure that no matter where we find ourselves uh, fiscally over the course of the next several months, that our sailors and their families are well taken care of, both in terms of the certainty of the pay and allowances and benefits and job security and so forth, uh, but also that they have meaningful work and important work for them uh, as they have volunteered to do uh, for our nation. I think that's, it's very important that we keep our sights on that. 
the second thing is uh, the importance that we place, the premium that we really place within naval forces and within naval aviation in particular, uh, with our carriers and our embarked air wings and our expeditionary forces that, that go forward in operating forward in whatever theater that happens to be, whether it's in the Central Command area of responsibility, it's the Western Pacific, uh, the Mediterranean, uh, across the Maghreb, wherever it happens to be, uh, that focus on forward deployed operations and making sure that uh, at the very least, and I say at the very least and underscore that, that our forces forward are well resourced, well taken care of, and have the support that they need and the, the funds and the resources that they need to be able to execute the very, very difficult mission set that we give them. them. Now certainly there's a tie back to how we get those forces ready to go, and I'll address that in, uh, in just a second. And then the third dimension is, uh, uh, that I think is, is probably uh, as important as anything else is, uh, is this idea that uh, decisions that we make today and planning that we do today to the extent that we can make them reversible. In other words, if we decide several weeks from now the decision that we made now has resources put against it. Can we back out of the decision and carry on with the business of the day? And I think that's very important, and that's informed a lot of the planning that we've done. I think probably all three of the members up here of the panel would tell you exactly the same thing. But the ability to back out of a, a, a decision that we make uh, and, and reconstitute and get back up on the horse and keep moving forward and the generation of operationally ready forces is very, very important. So those are three of our guiding principles. Uh, for me, uh, my job description is really quite simply to man, to train, and equip the aviation forces for the United States Navy. I've got a specific role here in the Pacific, but as the Air Boss, I've got global responsibilities uh, and global equities in making sure that our aircraft carriers their embarked air wings and all of our aviation forces uh, are properly man trained and equipped to do the missions that we ask them to do. So when I think about some of the, the challenges that we have both under uh, a full year continuing resolution as well as the, uh, the specter of, of sequestration, I really look at, the, at that, those what ifs along the three axes of my ability to properly man properly train and then properly equip our aviation forces, both today and into the future. And this is a very complex problem, as you might imagine. Uh, we own within our large organization that is the United States Navy some very, very big machines, uh, very complex machines that do very well when you get them up on the governor and they run at high speed. They don't do particularly well when you grind them down into first gear and then expect uh, some change in the output. So let me give you a specific example. And I can do this along each one of these three axes of manning, training, and equipping. Uh, our pilot throughput uh, down in our training command uh, that, that delivers ready uh, pilots, uh, naval flight officers, and air crew is a very complex machine. It has a lot of moving parts. We require resources, not only uh, up aircraft and, and instructors and flying hour dollars and parts and contracts and things like that to all come together at a, a single point in time, but uh, it takes a, a long time to establish what I would call equilibrium with that big machine. So some of the what-if planning we've done right now under both scenarios, both a, a, a full year continuing resolution as well as sequestration, and I think as you all know, the dollar figures that are associated with uh, each one of those uh, potential eventualities are uh, pretty significant, and they directly impact the readiness accounts of the United States Navy, which I'm most interested in, those readiness accounts that deliver parts, and for me, flying hour dollars and the ability to, to fix and maintain our aircraft and our aircraft carriers. Um, in the pilot training program, when you start to pull back the lever, when you start to downshift that big machine from fifth gear to fourth gear to third gear to second gear, uh, there's, a, there's an impact clearly in the near term and most definitely in the long term in the product that we put out the back end. Well, if you trace that, that uh, uh, molecule all the way through the system, that now has an impact on how long we keep aviators in their first tour, 
and career milestones thereafter, their ability to finish successfully their first tour with all the proper training and skills that they need, move to a shore duty assignment, and then move on to a department head assignment back to sea and so forth. So all these complex machines are very highly synchronized. Let me give you another example. Uh, and Brad mentioned it in his opening. One of the potential uh, financial impacts that we're looking at, specifically in the aviation community, under a full year uh, continuing resolution, is uh, not inducting any new aircraft into our aviation depots uh, for the third and fourth quarter of the year. Uh, that would be on the order of about uh, 100 some aircraft, a few more than that. Most of those inductions would happen in the fourth quarter of the fiscal year. So again, back to the point about being able to gracefully back out or quickly back out of something, a uh, decision that we make if, if we uh, found ourselves with some either ro reprogram funds or some funds that, uh, uh, that show up in a different uh, format. And our aircraft inductions are on such a schedule where we can make a decision today and relatively easily back out of that here uh, in the near term. But the longer term impact, if we follow through with this, uh, this entire decision, will be I now no, no longer am getting the modernization and higher level maintenance, that depot level maintenance, the artisans that we can't do at the squadron level, and the impact then to the flight line readiness, our ability to have up and ready aircraft, the resources that I need to man, train, and equip our aviation force today, we would start to feel those impacts. Again, it depends on the community, but we'd feel those impacts almost immediately, which then gets directly to the value proposition uh, that I have and part of my job description, which is to generate the ready forces that th can then go forward and do our nation's business. So the point that I want to leave you with, and happy to go into more detail as we get into the questioning, but the uh, the interstitial relationship, this, this very uh, complex interconnected relationship that we have across certainly all the dimensions that I deal with, the manning, the training, and the equipping of our forces is something that we have to keep in mind and we are with our planning. Uh, with that, I'll pass the mic to, uh, to Admiral Copeman and standing by ready for your questions. Hey, thanks, Brian. I appreciate you taking on the uh, moderator duties here today to keep the conversation going after we're done talking. Um, I won't, uh, I'll try not to repeat what my esteemed colleague from the Air Force has stated, um, but I have a very similar task that he does. I'm responsible for the manning, training, and equipping of the surface forces in the Pacific Fleet and for setting the policies and guidance for the manning, training, and equipping of all the surface forces in the United States Navy. Um, as the SWO boss, I'm, I'm focused on war fighting and readiness, and I look, in the lens by which I look at it, through as a type commander is through the PESTO pillars, the people. Do I have enough people on all of the ships? Are they properly trained to do their mission, to operate their gear and maintain their gear? Um, do they have, and then you get into equipment, is it maintained properly? Um, is it easily maintained? Uh, do the people know how to maintain it? Is the depot maintenance adequate to get it to its expected service life? And then I get into supply. Do I have enough spare parts on the ships? So when something breaks out at sea, that the, that the crew can go down and draw and have a pretty good probability that the part is there. And then you look at training. Uh, is the classroom training, is the fleet training in the basic training phase? Do I have enough people in the ATGs to train? Are the A schools and the C schools adequate to teach the sailors how to maintain and operate the gear? And, and then I look at ordnance. Do I have enough ordnance of the right types to meet the threats that are out there? Um, and as Ron O'Rourke said in an earlier panel, I don't know if anybody was in here to hear it, but in the surface Navy, we dug a really deep hole across all these pillars over the last 12 or 15 years. Uh, over the last three years, we have invested a tremendous amount of money to dig us out of this hole. We've uh, increased our depot maintenance funding by about 40 percent across the force in three years. That's, that's a lot of money that we've thrown at it. Um, we've added a lot of people, billets. We've bought billets to put them back on ships to put them back in the regional maintenance centers. By 2016, we'll have doubled the size of the enlisted and officer force in the regional maintenance centers, which, which improves the ability of the sailors to become expert tradesmen in fixing and maintaining their gear. Um, and the point is, it takes a long time for these initiatives to take hold. You don't just snap your fingers and take a guy to boot camp, and then six months later, he's a journeyman or a master. It takes a long, long time to do it. So we've started down this road about three years ago to fix some really severe 
structural foundational problems in the surface warfare enterprise, and we're making good progress on, on getting there. Um, in the maintenance world, in addition to the funding that we've thrown in, we've, in, we've gotten a much more technological backing to how we do maintenance. Um, technical foundation papers, the SurfMEP, uh, Surface Team 1 has stood up. Um, ship sheets that keep track of maintenance that we have to defer so we don't forget about it. And, you know, and a ship goes in a dock 12 years later and we've got to replace half the spars and the tanks and stuff like that. So we've added a lot more uh, discipline into the process over the last three years. Um, and so, like Secretary Work said, you know, going up in today's environment is staying even. And if we could stay even, I would love to do that, although we've got, as uh, Mr. O'Rourke said, we have, we have produced a pretty big hole which we have to dig out of. Um, our maintenance backlog is probably on the order of about $3 billion. Um, if we could do everything we wanted to do to fix the, the training infrastructure, it'd probably be about $3 billion across the fit-up, not all in one year. I mean, it's just, you know, you can't swallow the elephant all in one bite. So these are, these are kind of the level of, uh, of where we're moving, and we've made some great progress in the last three years. Uh, and, and these looming, uh, the continuing resolution, and the sequestration that are looming over its head will, as, as Mr. Work said, it will grind us all to a halt on all the progress we've made and actually, I think, cause us to backtrack. And, um, and in my uh, enterprise, um, I'm, I'm pretty certain if, if these two events occur during this execution year, we'll end up pretty hollow at the end of this fiscal year, as Mr. Work indicated. I'm, I'm certain of that. And, uh, and the second thing i got to uh, worry about is the slow bosses. i got to think about what's the force in 2025 and, and beyond, what's that going to look like? Because those decisions have to be start being made now on what, what's the future fleet, what weapons are we going to buy, are we going to go rail guns, are we going to do laser beams, are we going to do high-powered microwaves? Can we cut down on the variance that we have in C5I systems and in combat systems and in HM&E? Um, because that helps all of these other pillows, pillars that I talked about. Admiral Blake said there's no point solutions than any of our problems. And there isn't. You can, you can pour a bunch of people at a problem, but if, if the equipment, if, if it's almost impossible to train them because every ship's got a different ship set, then you maybe haven't attacked the problem uh, correctly. So anyway, that's, look forward to your questions, and I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague from the Marines. I think uh, hopefully the point isn't missed here that uh, this, this is a team up here. And as the aviation side goes, does it affect my wing? Third Ma and Miramar and their airplanes. And if we plan on getting out into the Pacific, I, I must, I need the help of, uh, uh, of the Navy to get out there. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's a, what the way, the, where the Navy goes, the Marine Corps is going to go. Just one point is this budget constraints really was nothing that started now. We were pretty aware of the fact that uh, we were going to have budget issues a couple of years ago. And uh, as it was mentioned earlier, when I was in Afghanistan, I had the British forces uh, under my command and Re regional command southwest. And many of you know the U.K. has gone through some significant budget constraints and, and, and challenges two years ago. And they kept saying, it's going to be your time soon. And, and so we've looked at it and we've done some preparations. For example, the majority of the Marine Corps' equipment was in Afghanistan. We had at the high, high point over 22,000 Marines uh, in Afghanistan and RC Southwest. The money that was used, that was the OCO funding that was used to fund our deployments to Afghanistan, we recognized pretty quickly that we were going to have to use that money uh, as best as we possibly can because it was going to go away sometime around 2013. The challenge for us was, and we had some pretty smart people that started figuring this out and saying, okay, how do we get our equipment reconstituted, refit, and back home? And do it in a way so that it's, we're using OPM, other people's money, rather than our own. And so the, the, we, the, the focus was, let's get it out of there. And then, of course, many of you may realize they closed the, the uh, G-locks in Pakistan and it really slowed down the process. But as of today, a majority of that equipment is now on its way back or already home, and it's come back on OCO funds. In preparation for the sequestration and continued resolution, you know, we're starting to take a look at other ways of, of cutting costs and saving money. Uh, 
the, all my commanders are aware of the fact that, you know, they've got to take a hard look at, can, at t, try, uh, TAD, deferring or canceling conferences, and uh, prioritizing exercises and training. I think we have looked at the Marine Corps and its priorities, and we've made some determinations. Number one, right now we have 7,500 Marines left in Afghanistan. That is our number one priority. We will not cut any funding or any support to the Marines that are deploying in OEF. So that's a hard line. And when you draw that line, fortunately still there is some OCO funds associated with, with it, but still it takes a significant amount of money to train these guys and equip them and get them ready to go. The second aspect, something that we will not cut, is our Marine Expeditionary Units and their deployments. Vitally important. If you want to avoid future Benghazis, you've got to have forces out there that are able to respond. And the Marine Expeditionary Unit is that force along with the Amphibious Ready Group. That's a team. They're forward present. We need those guys. We're not going to cut funds from, from, from the, the MUs and the MU deployments. Obviously, as I first opened up with, though, uh, how Tom deals with uh, his maintenance issues on his ships weighs very heavily on our Marine Expeditionary Units and its capabilities to get out there and do what they need to do. A couple of areas where we're going to, we're going to have some problems is we're going to have some problems with our COCOMs. COCOMs want Marines and Naval Expeditionary Forces in each one of their theaters. We can't provide them. The demand signal, as was mentioned earlier, is already too high, and it's going to get even trickier as we go through the next year. Unit readiness. This is the one that scares us the most. We'll be able to get those units that are assigned to MUSE. We'll be able to get those units that are going to Afghanistan. We'll have them ready. They'll have everything they need. But if we have a crisis and we need a response force, and that response force is coming from the United States, we're not going to have ready units. And to me, that makes me very nervous. You know, we're just doing an exercise right now down here at 32nd Street. We're using the Marine Expeditionary Brigade, along with the Expeditionary Strike Group, working crisis response, crisis response capabilities. But if we take these cuts, we're not going to be able to fund them. And that's going to be a serious problem. And then lastly, Pacific rebalancing. This is conference is about the rebalance of the Pacific. We have some great ideas in working with our Navy counterparts to, to position Marine forces strategically throughout the Pacific region so that they can work with our partners and build capacity and capabilities. Places like Darwin and Guam, where we just experimented with a, a Marine rifle company in Darwin, and we're looking to expand it to 2,500 Marines. But there's going to be challenges. Part of it is we have to put sets of equipment into Australia in order to maintain their presence and for them to do training. Those, that equipment could be costly. We're not sure we'll be able to, to uh, position that equipment. Same thing with transportation in and around the Pacific, whether it's aviation, or whether it's air or it's, it's sea, it's costly. The joint high-speed vessels, something the price tag on those is $50,000 a day. Very, very costly. So will we be able to show the flag and work with our allies in the Pacific? And I think that's going to be the, the significant challenge for us. With that, I'll, I'll end and I'll turn it over to questions. All right. Thank you very much. I think that got us off to a really good start. We understand uh, some of the some of the problems and some of the vectors that uh, that are being looked at in order to uh, to address the coming problems. Um, I would like to start off with a question. Um, I, I think two of our panelists mentioned this. That the uh, ad, right now, um, for example, I, I spent some time yesterday on the USS Benfold, guided missile destroyer, just back. It still has a lay around her bow. She went on an extended deployment, um, helped monitor a rocket launch off North Korea. Uh, and it, and the first thing you see when you go out on the pier is this gigantic anchor painted gold, signifying excellent retention. Uh, the, the people on that ship obviously love their jobs. They're signing back up. But in order to keep moving at this high op tempo and to do it with less money, less training, uh, less support, uh, it's going to get tougher and tougher to take care of those sailors. And I'm sure the same thing is, is true of Marines. What, what will you do, what, what can you do to make sure you take care of sailors, Marines, and their families 
as we uh, if we enter uh, as we enter this period of declining budgets. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you that Ben Fold's a good ship because I had command of it 12 years ago. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the priority of the department is to make sure that the pay and benefits of the active duty sailors and their families and all the programs associated with it are the number one priority to be protected in the event of the, the sequestration or the uh, continuing resolution continuing throughout the year. That's the number one priority stated by the Secretary and the Chief of Naval Operations. Um, and then the second priority, as General Tulin uh, stated, is to protect the readiness and the manning and the ability of the forward deployed forces to conduct their mission. So what's left? Well, it, it's the stuff that, we, that we've hinted at that you've heard other speakers talk about. And uh, you look at what you can affect, and it's maintenance. And so you, you look at 10 or so availabilities in San Diego and 10 or so available uh, availabilities in Norfolk, and you put those at risk because they are reversible. You can, re if you get the funding, you can do those maintenance availabilities. Now, it doesn't mean they're instant reversible. There's planning that has to go in. You've got to plan for the availability. You've got to get them in the yard. They've got to fit with the port loading of the thing. So when we say reversible, it doesn't mean it's not forever. There may be some delay involved in this. So um, I think that the Department of Defense, and I know for sure the Department of the Navy, is, is absolutely and positively uh, locked in on making sure that the pay and benefits of the active duty sailors and Marines that we've asked to, to maintain this op tempo that they've been maintaining over the last... 10 years or, or receive everything that's owed them and that they've earned. Yeah, if I could just uh, to add what uh, Tom just said, uh, and really along two, uh, two ways of answering the question. Uh, in, the, in the here and now, I think beyond the, the pay and benefits uh, uh, guiding principle, which we all understand, appreciate, we've embraced, and, and, uh, and that's exactly the right thing for us to do. But uh, I, th I think we've got an obligation to make sure that we show our uh, sailors and Marines and, by extension, their families that there is viability in their service into the future. And that takes a lot of different uh, uh, twists and turns with it. It's, uh, it's certainly a viable uh, career path that has appropriate promotion opportunities. It's the training that goes into making sure that we've got folks uh, well-educated with the skills that we need when we need them at the right place and time. Uh, both in the fleet and, uh, and, and certainly ashore. And then it's also making sure that, uh, uh, that we're very mindful of, uh, which we are, of some of the impacts that we could be causing downstream. I'll give you a great case in point. Uh, I alluded earlier to some of the challenges that we'll have on the aircraft side uh, in the event that we uh, were not able to induct the, uh, the airframes as we have planned right now uh, for our third and fourth quarter of this fiscal year, and this would happen under a continuing resolution. There's kind of a complementary piece that goes with that, which is our engine maintenance. We do a certain amount of, of aircraft engine maintenance uh, at the unit level, at the squadron level, uh, but there's a higher level of maintenance that's required to overhaul engines and get them RFI ready for uh, issue again at the higher level of maintenance, at the depot level. So if I stop sending engines to the, the depot for their work, uh, Again, in, consistent with the priorities that we, we know are exactly right, we keep our forces forward, fully outfitted and operating properly, and we'll do exactly that with regard to aircraft engines. But if you don't have, if you're not uh, constantly feeding the pipeline there and you don't have the throughput, then what you end up uh, doing, perhaps not immediately, but over the course of several months, is you begin to whittle away now at your stock back at home, which has a direct uh, impact on your ability to generate readiness on the flight line of our squadrons that are getting ready to go next. So there are a couple different ways you can work your way through that. You can, uh, obviously with fewer engines, you can move them from aircraft to aircraft. That's not a very good model for our sailors. Uh, in fact, we've made some very dedicated efforts and we've put a lot of funds over the last couple of years uh, across a number of our engines and a number of our, our communities to make sure we are what we call whole with our engines. In other words, we have a readiness goal. I know exactly how many engines we need to produce at every level of maintenance every month so that we don't put the onus on our sailors of having to swap engines from one, one jet to, to the next to be able to keep aircraft up and running and combat ready. And so we know what that looks like when it doesn't work particularly well and we owe it to our sailors not to go back there again. So there's a direct tie between 
uh, the financial challenges that we have and where we could feel that, uh, that impact pretty, pretty immediately on the flight line. I think that's important for all of us to understand. Uh, the, the second comment I would make, and Tom hit on it earlier, um, each one of the, the uh, supported type commanders, I think that's the right term now, not the lead type commanders, but the supported type commanders uh, for aviation, surface, and submarine, uh, were given a, uh, there was a request that I took as a tasker from the Chief of Naval Operations to articulate a vision, a fix from where you are today, and then where do you want to get your community by 2025, and what does that vision look like? And in my particular community, that includes uh, integrating a lot of new capabilities and bringing a lot of new systems online so that we can get out of with some of our old legacy uh, systems that are very expensive to maintain and to operate today and have long logistics tails with them and get into some of the newer equipment. We owe it to our sailors and our Marines to, to commit and stay on that path, in my estimation. So, uh, and the longer that we we stay in some of the older legacy aircraft, the more onus we put on folks in my world where I know the maintenance man hour per flight hour is extraordinarily high. So those are two areas, uh, Brad, that I think we need to uh, make sure we get very clear-eyed focus on here as we make decisions moving forward. General, you want to take a crack at that? One point, the spirit of our fighting men and women is essentially is essential. And if they think that mom and dad are poor and they have no money, and that they can't provide the things that they need in order to go out and do their job, we have a problem. And that's one of the things that we need to guard the most. Okay. One of the panelists, uh, early, one of the uh, uh, speakers on the earlier panel, uh, offered this wonderful chestnut, which is, no, you, you should never waste a good crisis. Uh, and the sense of that, of course, is that uh, when things get tough, sometimes problems that seemed intractable can be broken open and solved. People have to think differently, and and maybe you can actually make something good come out of the situation. Um, you know, one thing that gets tossed around a lot is uh, trying to shed some more of our base infrastructure, uh, looking for another BRAC. Uh, another thing that uh, gets talked about is by uh, Admiral Copen now and, and Admiral Buss is getting rid of of legacy equipment, of necking down to a, a smaller set of things that you have to train on and maintain. Um, but I'd like to ask you, gentlemen, if there are other big problems that, that you might be able to solve uh, just by dint of the oncoming pressure. Uh, I'll, I'll take the first whack at that. Um, the And I'll circle back to the uh, to one of the challenges I have in the aviation community, which is the the operating and maintaining uh, some of our old model series. So the so the vision that that I've articulated to our service chief on how we get from the fix of where we are today to uh, 10 or 12 years hence really goes that track line goes directly through uh, being able to make very very uh, smart uh, near term and longer term business decisions about. Uh, retiring some of the debt and the, and the legacy platforms that we have and then making smarter investments about how we get our people trained and, and, uh, and ready to go. Uh, a great case in point is uh, with the, and I've spent most of the time talking about the aircraft side so far, but it's also true on the aircraft carrier side. So uh, we are by law an 11 carrier Navy. We're, we're in a period right now, we uh, started the inactivation process for USS Enterprise. That started on the 1st of December. So we're now down to 10 aircraft carriers, and we are very, very reliant on uh, USS Gerald Ford uh, delivering on time when she's scheduled to a couple of years from now. So one of the challenges that we have in this, uh, this current fiscal environment is making sure that we can make ends, ends meet with our new equipment, our new gear that we have coming online. That ship in particular was designed with manpower savings, with uh, logistics savings with uh, operations and maintenance savings built into it and we're doing much the same in, uh, in many of the, the new aircraft systems and unmanned systems that we're bringing online. And so uh, back to the vision and being able to execute the vision the way we've laid it out, uh, that, that vision is at risk quite frankly right now uh, given some of the, the, uh, the fiscal challenges that we have. So what, uh, what I want to make sure we're guarding against is 
uh, near-term solutions that may save a dollar today but cost us 2 or $3 in the long run. I think we have to be very mindful of that. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the BRAC is way above my pay rate, and I think that the Department of Defense had two rounds in the last budget that uh, they're not going to move that. I, and so I, I won't discuss that. But I, I think one of the things that we, you know, like I said, when budget when budget times get tight, you got to think. And so you, you do sit back and you look at different ways of how we do stuff. And uh, one of the things I think that, uh, at least in the, the sphere of influence that I have, and I've talked about it a couple of weeks ago at SNA, and I'll talk about it again here very quickly. And it's it's this uh, this idea that we have too many variants of the same thing of equipment that do the same things, and it it bleeds over into how you train the people and how you know if you, if if you have you know I, I give the example we have like 15 or 20 different infrared search and track things. They all do exactly the same thing, um, and so why don't we have two or three that are really close? And so we we buy circuit cars in in quantity. Um, and it's this, this notion of competition, you know, figure out which the best one is, compete, and then, and then there's winners and there's losers. Um, C5I systems, it's, it's just astounding how many variations that we have when you include the lands that we have and the radios that we have and the antennas and stuff. There's just hardly any two ships that are the same, which causes uh, supply problems. It, it causes training problems and all this kind of stuff. So I think that's, for me, um, I, I think attacking that problem aggressively over the coming years, I think, is probably going to be pretty high payoff for me. And I think it will improve um, our ability to conduct prompt sustained combat operations at sea, which in the end is what I have to enable my sailors and the ships that they ride on to be able to do. Just uh, I think that because we've been at war for 12 years and because our nation has provided really everything that we've needed to fight the war the right way, that we've gotten a lot of equipment and a lot of supplies. And I think in some ways maybe we've moved away from the discipline of managing the equipment the way we should. And I believe that there's probably some ways that we can save money by increasing the level of accountability and responsibility for everything that we have across the board. I think from my perspective as a Marine, uh, the amount of uh, equipment that we've given our guys and, and some of the stuff that we've written off uh, as a result of uh, a, a little bit of a lack of discipline is something that we're going to have to tighten up. And I think we can find savings there. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to invite uh, anybody in the audience who wants to ask a question to please come up to the mic and, and ask away. Um, Gentlemen, we have, we, have, we have a bunch of sailors and, and possibly some Marines uh, in the audience, uh, but I want to offer one for the industry folks here. Uh, what would you tell them uh, as, you, as, as you seek to solve your own problems? How can they help? I'll start with that. I, um, I had the opportunity just last week to, uh, to travel out to Fort Worth and sit down with the uh, Lockheed Martin team and get some insights into where we are programmatically with uh, uh, Joint Strike Fighter. It was a very enlightening visit for me, and I think if you talk to Lockheed Gang, they'll tell you it was enlightening for them to hear from me on some of the things that were on my mind. Um, but I think that kind of interaction is extraordinarily important. We ought to do more talking, not less, at this particular juncture, I believe. Uh, but the other thing that I would uh, advocate for is a very, very clear-eyed view and a what I call a common operational picture among all of us, those in uniform, uh, our acquisition folks, uh, industry, those that write our contracts and others, and what today's reality looks like. And so uh, I believe one of the things that, uh, that is most important for us at this particular juncture uh, as a service, and certainly within aviation, is um, for everybody to have a clear-eyed view of what some of the potential impacts are and how that puts at risk uh, a strategy that we believe is the right one to execute. I mentioned earlier that tying this back to the rebalancing of the Pacific is, is uh, an important thing for us to circle back on. Uh, part of my vision for naval aviation that I've articulated to my leadership, my chain of command, is firmly rooted in the ability to, to bring new capabilities online in the Pacific theater, and to the extent that we can within aviation, do that first in the Pacific before we do it elsewhere. It won't be true in all cases, 
but in many cases it is. And I think that's very important strategically for us as a Navy to be able to do that. I think it's very important for the Marine Corps to do exactly the same thing. And I think that sends a very, very powerful message around the globe uh, at exactly the right time. And it's in keeping with uh, some of the strategic guidance and the vision that's been articulated at many pay grades above me in the chain of command. And so our ability to deliver on a vision like that, on a future like that, uh, I think we, we all need to understand what the risk is and to the extent that we can develop advocacy and articulation of what that risk is with a common picture across industry and those in uniform, uh, I think that will be, will be better off. So again, I think more conversation, not less at this particular juncture is where we need to be. Um, it's, it's a team effort. Um, we owe industry some things, I think, particularly when you talk about shipbuilding. We owe a stable design, uh, a design that's complete before we start cutting steel. Uh, we owe requirement stability and we owe funding stability. Um, and, in, you know, it, it sounds like nirvana. Don't, will we ever achieve it? No, but we can do a much better job, I think, as a Navy team. And we are doing a better job on it in, in recent uh, shipbuilding programs. Um, and it shows because the ships are, are coming in on, under cost, under schedule, the Virginia class, the, the uh, TKEs, the MLPs uh, uh, are great examples of that. Um, as, as Mr. Work said, you know, the, uh, the funding environment is probably going to be steady at best case and going down. So if we want to keep the same number of ships going that we've got going right now, which is the best it's been in a long, long time, I think we can do it, but there's going to be some trade-offs and there's got to be some risks um, in, in what the capabilities are. We have to build ships that are affordable because there is a there is a uh, there is something to the old uh, saying that there's a quantity has a quality all of its own. Um, as General Tulin has intimated, you have to have the right number of ships out there if you want to have forces forward. Um, it's not good enough to have a very small number of ships that are very very capable, and you can't be everywhere you got to be. So there's there's uh, some risk, and, and that gets in what I look in 2025. Um, I don't know what the fleet's going to look like, but I think it's going to look a little different than the fleet we got right now because of the resource uh, realities that we face. So um, those are the things I think we're talking, you know, and again, I get back to variance. You know, it, it's, it's cheaper for all of us to get 100 circuit cards of the same kind instead of 100 different circuit cards for, you know, 30 different pieces of gear that does the same thing. So that's the sort of discipline that, you know, we owe it to you to, to describe what we need, and then we have to be demanding customers on, on what we get. So that's my two cents. I think they covered it. Okay. All right. Uh, questions from the audience? Hi, I'm Joe Mazafro with CFC. I appreciate your comments. All of you in your prepared remarks talked about effects, what the effect of the budget going down, the, in, the in, uh, stability, and so forth and so on. Uh, a couple of things. First off, uh, sequestration is the law of the land. It's what you should be planning for. So, you know, that's a known known. CR, let's hope they continue it or we shut the government down. So my question here is, these are realities, as we heard in an earlier panel. What's the trade space you've got to make this stuff add up? Not what the bad effects are if it happens. Well, I, I guess maybe I, I could just kick it off by just saying I think some of the trade space in, for, for the Marine Corps is taking a look at the size of the force. Manpower is very expensive. And, uh, you know, we, we accelerated pretty quickly to 202,000 Marines. And it, it was costly, a lot of effort put into it. But now we need to look at what is the optimal force that we need. But more importantly, what is the force that we can afford? Uh, and try and hopefully get a good cross balance there between both. So uh, th that's the challenge for us right now. And it, if we look at the world situation and we look at the need for crisis response capabilities, it's intimidating because you almost got to say to yourself, we're forced to go one way, but the situation is demanding more. And that's where maybe capability and some of the things that uh, are coming out of advanced equipment like Ospreys and new ships and that stuff, maybe that capability can compensate for size. But that's how we're looking at it is, is manpower. But we're doing it in a way that we don't break faith with our Marines and sailors. Because the reality is, is we've signed them up. We said, you're coming in, you're going to be there for six years or whatever. 
We want to avoid things like selective early retirement boards. And so, so trying to balance that, realizing that manpower is expensive, is going to be a, 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 an, an important first step for us in that effort. I mean, in execution year, the trade space comes almost primarily out of the operations maintenance funds. Uh, air ship and aircraft availabilities, those are the uh, base operating support, the ability to run the bases uh, and conduct uh, maintenance on the bases, uh, demolition products, you know, and, and some fly hour. I mean, that's really the only trade space there is in execution year. So that's where uh, most of the cuts are targeted. There's some uh, acquisition that we won't be able to do. Um, there's going to be at least one DDG, I think, if the Seacrest, if the CR continues on, that we will, or the continuing resolution um, doesn't come to pass. You know, and then sequestration just compounds that. And sequestration is 31 days in a wake up, I think, from from today. Um, so that's the trade space in execution year. The trade space in the in the outer years is, is all the stuff that we've talked about. It, it's being as efficient as as you can. Um, it's putting four DDGs in, in Rota so you can do the mission with less. Forces. It's 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 the way you operate the force with LCSs uh, on the Forward Pacific. So it doesn't necessarily mean that your presence goes down, but how you s supply that presence is going to have to change. It can't be the traditional method by which we have you know five to make one. Um, and so we're looking. And, and the Marines are spreading around the Pacific and Darwin and Guam. And so these are some of the things that we're we're doing to keep maintain the forward presence with less resources to do it with. And, uh, and I'd answer it uh, from two approaches, from the strategic level and then from the tactical level. Let me start with the tactical first. Uh, and Tom's exactly right. The trade space that we're talking about right now, budgetarily, is principally in the readiness accounts. It's the flying hour dollars that I need. It's the aviation depot maintenance. It's the ship depot maintenance that both of us need because that's where we need to go today to balance the books. And, and that's an important thing to remember. You know, a lot of this planning is about balancing the books because we are required by law to live within our means. So we're, we're forced to do some, it bounds the problem significantly. Uh, within aviation, we have a pretty predictable model, a pretty predictable framework uh, in how we generate our readiness. You put a bunch of resources in the front end, whether that's people, parts, uh, up aircraft, jet fuel, engines, and so forth, and it produces at some level, and it produces a predictable level of readiness at, at the back end. The same is true to a certain extent with our aircraft carriers and, and their crews. We understand how that, that, that readiness model works. So back to where the trade space is, if we're taking money out of the readiness accounts now, or that's where our planning is leading us, by default, because of the way our engine works, because of the way this big machine that I described earlier works, the output out the back end will be less than what it is today. That, that's a given. That's at the tactical level. Then the question strategically becomes, is that enough? Is it good enough? Or what risk do you incur by your output not matching what your strategy is? Uh, Brad mentioned in his intro that I spent a little bit of time in Baghdad doing some strategic planning probably the crucible of all crucibles. And, um, and so I'm, when you start at the strategic level and you say, always let me go in the front door with a strategy that I want to achieve with a set of outcomes and effects that I want to achieve strategically, and then map that downhill to your resources and do you have that right or not. So this is the problem that we have right now. We have a strategy, I think, that we all agree to. We all understand exactly what it means and what it calls for and what we have to do to deliver against that. But when I do the tactical level planning at the, at, the, uh, uh, at the unit level, at the individual level, given the constraints that we could have budgetarily, you can't make those two things meet. So we're dealing trade space at the tactical level right now in my estimation. Sir. Uh, retired Navy Captain Jim Kelly. Uh, General, could you uh, elaborate on what you see as the future of the Marine Corps and this uh, coming austere fiscal Climate, is it likely that the Corps will ever be involved uh, as a primary, uh, you know, service in a land war like Afghanistan again, or will you revert to a more amphibious role? I think, you know, we run the risk of becoming absorbed into a, a land army with the, the fact that for the past 12 years we've been engaged in Iraq and Afghanistan. And although we've maintained our amphibious roots, particularly with the Marine Expeditionary Units, who have continued to deploy throughout that period, both in the Pacific and in Central Command. 
However, we did have to diminish one expeditionary unit in our in the Mediterranean in order to uh, man and equip uh, our Iraq and Afghan forces. The reality is is that our roots are amphibious. Uh, we need we belong on the ships. That's where we that's where we're going back to, and we're going back with uh, you know a, a major effort. I'm spending an awful lot of time down here just begging these guys to, hey, could you give me a ship for a couple of weeks? <laughs> Which he says no, but he's really a nice guy. He's been helping me out. <laughs> but I think that the future for the Marine Corps, particularly with some of the advancements that we have, I, just to use the Osprey, for example, I mean, it has changed the dynamics of assault forces from the sea. Now 400 miles is nothing. And, and I think uh, that we'll, we will be the force in readiness. We will be that one that's first on the scene and provide that enabling capability for follow-on forces. It's very interesting when you look at the Army. You know, the Army is starting to take a look at what we've been doing with the Marine Navy team. And they're now trying to expand into that arena because they know that's the future. Crisis response and forward presence. So I, I see more of the same. But with increased capabilities, it's going to make us that much better. All right. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Rick Purnell, and uh, I've been in this defense industry for quite a while. And I think the first one of these conferences I came to, uh, sitting in the two vice admiral chairs, might have been Schultz and Walters back in the 80s. And uh, the same question would have come up was uh, why can't we deliver a package of full requirements to industry for them to build on day one? We still asking the same questions. Would you like to take a shot at why we cannot solve that particular problem? I'm not. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> I'm not qualified to answer. Nor am I. I mean, I have not been an uh, acquisition professional and haven't haven't uh, dealt in that world. All right. Sure. Maybe that's the answer. I think I have a – I think it's probably a two-part question, but it involves all three of you gentlemen. Having been on an uh, LST with Marines for a significant period of time, I found that sailors and Marines can get along very well together as long as everyone's busy. If there's going to be forces drawn down, do you see a way for cross-training between Marines and sailors on our ships. Much of the communications equipment is the same, radars are similar, lots of other things are similar. And then for the air arm, do you see more opportunities to achieve readiness through simulations? Simulators, I should say. Yeah. Um, our sailors do not have any idle time. Um, the sailors are extremely busy. They've probably never been busier than they are right now the, the, as a result of added missions, the op tempo, um, and all the stuff I talked about before. There's a few less people on ships than there were when they were designed, um, and so on and so forth. We're replacing some of them, but again, it takes a long, long time to do it. So, you know, the – so to go into your simulation thing, I think there's a lot of – a lot to be gained there. Um, I went through a couple of the booths and saw some of the some of the things they're doing with electronic tech manuals and and you know having a guy that's able to go and look at a videotape of the piece of maintenance, whether it's corrective or preventative, that he's supposed to do. I mean that that's really powerful than sitting there reading through a, a 30 page tech manual with no pictures, you know, trying to discern what I'm supposed to do that I you know they taught me this in school four years ago, but I haven't done it since. Um, so I, I think there's a lot that can be gained there. We, um, the submarine force has done an exceptional job investing in simulators. They have a, the, the Smitty trains a shore-based uh, acoustic trainer, combat systems trainer, um, and it's in addition to the fact that they do a lot more ASW underway than we than the surface force does. Their sonar techs are much much more proficient than ours at the same point in their careers, um, and I think part of it is this this idea of simulation. We have added a lot of simulation and high fidelity for, sh for ship handling and in the littoral combat uh, ship program where we train to qualify officers and enlisted folks before they show up to the ship and then they are, they are you know, they're EOP qualified, they're watch stationed, and then we train the 
the teams and the train to certify. So we have taken advantage of that. I think we need to do more of it. Um, I think it's more effective. Uh, there's, there's a mix between classroom training. There's some of it's required, but I don't think you need to have somebody sitting in a classroom for two years learning a high-tech piece of gear, and then he goes to the ship, and that's not exactly what it had in the classroom because we didn't keep things up to date. So I, I, I think we can gain a lot by doing increasing our use of uh, uh, computer-based training and simulation. And let me uh, take a swing at this pitch, too, because these were two terrific questions. Uh, first, first of all, with regard to uh, cross-training and, and integration, uh, I will tell you that I think, at least from my vantage point, I think the Navy and the Marine Corps do a terrific job in this regard uh, already. We, uh, is there more that we can do? Certainly. And as General Tulin talked about, as the Marines come back to sea, there will be more and more opportunities, I contend. <coughs> Excuse me. I was fortunate enough to be a carrier strike group commander for a, a strike group that had a, a marine aviation squadron, F-18 squadron, that was part of the air wing. And we have an initiative within Navy and Marine Corps aviation called TAI, TAI Tactical Aviation, Tactical Air Integration, where we bring marine squadrons out and we embed them in our uh, embarked air wings. Very, very successful program. We don't have as much capacity as we would like, certainly, but, but it's a very, very successful program. And I think if you talk to both uh, marine aviators and, and uh, Navy aviators, they would tell you that that's a great cross-pollinization of capabilities uh, between the two services. There are more opportunities like that growing in the future as we bring some of these new capabilities and platforms online. Uh, and we're all already doing some cross-training at, uh, uh, at the individual and the unit level. We've got uh, uh, mixed Navy and Marine uh, uh, training pipeline squadrons now and our fleet replacement squadrons and so forth. So we've been doing this as a matter of routine and in my community for a number of years. Uh, with regard to simulators, how much time do you have? I could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about this because uh, I will tell you that, uh, first of all, based on where we are today in my community with simulators and simulation compared to where I was when I first started out as a junior officer, there's no comparison. So we've leveraged a lot of the uh, technological improvements over the years. We've linked simulators together to get more realistic training and the kind of things that you can't necessarily do out in the, the field because you either just don't have the airspace to do it or you don't have the threat environment that we can generate in the simulators. And that's a growth industry. I, I believe there's more and more that we can do with regard to our simulators and the capabilities that they have. Very important point because as we look at some of the new platforms we're bringing online, like the Joint Strike Fighter, I contend there are mission sets that that aircraft will be able to do that you won't be able to practice any place other than in a high fidelity simulator to get the proper threat representation and so forth. So this is an area that we've talked about a lot throughout my career in aviation. I would tell you that I'm very proud the last decade or so we have committed to putting the money and the technology where, our, uh, uh, where we have said we would. Uh, there's a lot more that we need to do, but I think at, at every level, at the unit level, at the individual level, uh, Tom talked about some of the, uh, the individual skills and how we grow those in folks and simulators, and I think that's a growth industry for the future. Just a quick on the simulation. It's also vitally important, and it's a way in which we'll be able to get through some of these financial constraints. The requirement just to train joint tactical air controllers with the limited number of flight hours that we're going to be looking at, simulation is going to be the only way we're going to be able to qualify them. And so it's vitally important that we continue to pursue that through industry. Craig Quigley, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your time and insights this afternoon. Admiral Copeman, this one's for you. Um, <laughs> What will be the maintenance philosophy of the new forward deployed vessels, the four DDGs in Rota, the LCS in Singapore? And second question, can we see more of that in the years to come of different types of vessels more or less permanently forward deployed? Yeah, the, uh, the, the, F, the forward deployed uh, DDGs in Rota will use a similar model that we do with the forward deployed naval forces in Japan. Um, and I think well, we will bring them home much like we do uh, the ships in Japan every five to seven years to do the big heavy, you know, going and dry dock uh, modernization type of yard periods. Um, for the LCS, their concept is that um, they will the, the hull will operate forward for about 18 months, and every four or five months a, a crew will swap out to that hull. And so um, there will just be 
PMS and voyage repairs done on those ships, and then they'll come back to the States uh, after that rotational period. And, and, and why do you do that? Well, it saves you, you know, since it's a big ocean, you, you've sailed across it. It takes, you know, 45 days to get from San Diego to Singapore. So in a six-month deployment, half of it's just going to and from. So the longer you stay there, um, the more presence you get out of, the, out of the hull. And so that ship was designed, you know, from its incept, inception to do that. So that's why we're going to do it. And, and it'll be a mix of uh, contractor and uh, some sailors doing the maintenance on that. Okay. And can we expect to see more forward deployed vessels of various types in the years ahead for the same reasons you just described? Yeah, I, I, I think it's something that we're, that, yeah, we're looking at that because, um, you know, it depends on where the budget goes. But I, as, a, as Mr. Work and uh, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs said, you know, the demand signal uh, far exceeds the supply. We don't think the demand signal is going to go down anytime soon. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to, to do our level best to, to figure out how to meet the demand signal the best way we can, you know, balancing, uh, you know, the strain on the sailors and, and finding innovative ways to deploy and, and maintain the ships. But we've got to do it correctly. We can't do it uh, on the fly. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Some question over here from a panelist from an earlier session. My question is for General Tulin. I think you're right about the fact that if you read the Army's capstone concept, what they actually want these days is to have the mission set that the Marine Corps has instead of the mission set that I think is likely coming for the Army, which is the sustained ground combat and the differentiation to the Marine Corps of forcible entry and the Pacific presence. If you could shed the sustained ground combat responsibilities, what would you do differently as a commander? If you could optimize to the forced entry um, amphibious operations, what would you be doing differently right now? You know, many of you probably heard the Commandant uh, talk about the Marine Corps as a middleweight force. And so the range of things that that middleweight force would do, particularly now as we move back to our, our naval expeditionary routes, is, you know, get, having the Marine Expeditionary Units forwardly deployed, having the capability to, you know, join that MU with a MEB on top of it to respond to crisis, whether it's a Benghazi situation or it's a, you know, a refugee crisis in Jordan, whatever. Um, what we're seeing, though, is that on the left end you have the Army that is looking for mission sets, and so they're looking at these regional forces, and they're sort of encroaching into the middleweight realm. But on the right side, you also have SOCOM, CIA, paramilitary guys. I mean, you have all those high-end missions. They're also starting to encroach. Uh, for example, you take uh, SOCOM and, you know, their efforts in establishing crisis response elements and crisis in, or in extremist forces with a float forward staging basis, they're starting to encroach in areas that I believe that's the Marines' mission. It's the Marines are the ones that are supposed to be forward deployed, be able to go in. So the Special Operating Forces obviously have a mission with, with each theater, but you see this growth in, now with AFSBs and CREs. So what we have to do is be smart. We need to, as, as Marine Corps, say, look, there's plenty of space in the Pacific for both the Army and the Marine Corps. Let's work this out. You guys want to station brigades in the Philippines or whatever? Fine. We can also work with that. They don't necessarily need to get on a ship, but we can work with them. And on the other side of the spectrum, we need to start working more diligently with the special operations community. We need, when they conduct an operation, we, we all know it, they, that if they get in trouble, they got to have somebody like us to be there, whether it's a trap or it's a PR or whatever. So working with them, bringing them sort of, you know, get, getting rid of the seams and sort of integrating is, I think, the right answer. And that, in an austere financial period, is probably a good way of going, going about the business. Okay. I think we'll make this the last question. Uh, Steve Wentz. Uh, my, my question is the, uh, the sea services have, over a very long period of time, accumulated a very large body of war technique and tradecraft, most of it pre-digital, much of it pre-fossil fuel, and quite a bit of it pre-industrial. And my question is, to what extent going forward we could mine this vast archive of uh, technique and tradition for solutions that, you know, 
once depended on not having expensive engines or not having many men. That's over to you guys. <laughs> I, I would say it would also apply to the Corsair. I'll let them start. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to be careful to stay in my, my swim lane here because it's a great question, and I think uh, probably all of us, perhaps based on uh, uh, fleet operational experience or maybe even some time back inside the Beltway, have some opinions we could offer. Uh, but I'll start with this. I, I really believe, and I'll harken back to a couple of jobs I had ago, uh, that, that uh, uh, highlighted for me the importance of stitching uh, science and technology and R&D efforts for the future with a clear understanding of where you've been in the past. And you look for those breakthrough opportunities that give you a step function increase uh, you know, I, I don't like the term skipping generations because generally when you do that, you trip and stumble, but give you the opportunity for uh, very innovative and very rapid changes. Uh, I like to talk about this in terms of things that are revolutionary and evolutionary. There's an awful lot we do in my world in, in aviation that is evolutionary in nature. Occasionally, we get a revolutionary breakthrough. I would argue very strongly that the integration of unmanned systems in across naval aviation, particularly when we start to bring those systems to the aircraft carrier, will be a revolutionary jump start in, in uh, uh, technology that's out there. And then we'll evolve. We'll figure out how to, how to use those systems and how to integrate them into war fighting. But um, back to the point, it, Previous assignments that I've had have highlighted, and I don't want to talk about protecting things because it's in this day and age, protecting anything is very, very challenging potentially. But I think making sure that you're properly invested in your science and technology and your R&D efforts for the future so that you can, you can mine and find very quickly those nuggets that have great potential. And one other esoteric thought, and then I'll turn it to, to, to the guys next to me. Um, one of the things, again, in my estimation, that we perhaps have not been as good at in the past that we need to be better at in the future uh, is uh, speeding to failure as quickly as we speed to success. And by that I mean if you find something that clearly in indicates to the fleet user, the operator, the acquisition professional, whoever, that it may not pan out being able to cut bait and move on to the next thing, the next nugget that offers some promise, I think is particularly important. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're driving at with your question, but I think I think what you're saying are, are there are there general principles that we can, you know, keep reusing over and over again that we, you know, through the history of the culture of the service, and I think there is. I mean, you look back and you just talk about the principle of war and you talk about the principle of offense. And um, I, I think every time that we uh, have gotten away from that and our enemy has a, a capability to offensively touch us at a greater range than we can touch them, uh, the long lance torpedo versus what we had uh, in, in World War II, um, the size of our cannons and, and the speed of our frigates and, you know, in the days of sail, and all the kind of thing. We, we had advantages there. And so I think we, we have to focus on that. And so um, what are the types of technologies that, that can do that? And I think in the future, um, as Admiral Greenard has said, I think it's got, with the pace of technology that changes, um, this, this idea, this notion that you have uh, modular combat, that you can deliver combat capability modularly, whether it's uh, off an LCS mission package or whether it's off the the, the wing of an F-18 or an EF-18, that, that you have the ability to upgrade without, a, you know, putting a ship in the yards for 18 months and ripping the guts out of it to add one new mission to it, which is, which is why ships become obsolete quicker than we want them to in the past. So um, I, I think that's what we have to do. We have to, we have to build these common backbones on whatever future platforms we do because it's about the mission that they can do. And I think it's, it's – it's where we have to go. We have to be able to upgrade the combat capability, and I think in particular more emphasis on the offensive capability. Uh, there's a lot to be said about conventional deterrence. If your enemy thinks that if he attacks you, he will immediately get attacked or at a much uh, 
and, and inflict much greater pain than he can inflict upon you, I think it makes him hesitate to attack you versus putting all your eggs in, in defense system. So. Yeah, think about open architecture and applications as opposed to firmware, hardware, and, and major ship upgrades. I think, you know, from a Marine Corps perspective, we just I, we have some strong incentives to want to innovate and, and look at ways of making things lighter, faster, reduced footprint, and those kinds of things. So we work very hard at that. And, and whether it's an expeditionary energy efforts where we, you know, have using solar energy. If you look out in Afghanistan, you see everybody's got solar panels. And, and so I, I think there's a good, strong incentive. You know, if you're a grunt and you know you got to catch 75 pounds, if I can lighten that load, and so they, they're willing to work through that. So we're, we're continuing to plug in that effort. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I think we've arrived at the end of our, our session here. Uh, just to bring it back to the, the title of this program, um, I think we've, uh, we've learned through a, a wide-ranging discussion that, that nevertheless managed to be very deep at points into the, the kinds of issues that um, the folks up here are thinking about. Uh, in the near term, uh, under such fiscal pressure, you basically it's, it's the levers of O&M. You don't have much else to do. The, 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 the problem uh, constrains the solution, um, and you're basically left with, with meat axes. But in the slightly longer term, you can start thinking about re-engineering your systems to make them easier to acquire and maintain and, and upgrade. Uh, you can think about buying more flexible platforms that will, uh, that will allow you to do the mission um, more flexibly without some of the attendant costs. Uh, and you can start thinking about where you put your forces and, and what you do with them. Um, so I'd like to thank my, uh, my, my panelists here, um, Admiral, Admiral and General. Um, thanks so much. Uh, uh, AFSI and, and Naval Institute, thank you for putting this together. Uh, and, and audience, thank you for asking such good questions. We'll see you later.